the idea that if you see God's face, you'll die. Now, there are groups in, in Christendom that believe this. The only problem is we're taught to seek His face. Which again, sounds like a really conflicting thing. So we're like passionately pursuing his face, hoping he doesn't show up. Okay? And that idea, the idea that if you see God's face, you'll die, puts within us a fear of intimacy and connecting with him and ultimately drives us more to a principle-oriented life than a presence-oriented life. And it's all about his presence. It's all about his presence. It's all about encounters with him. Principles and guidelines are good. I teach them. I have books filled with them. However, it's about him. And plus, let's just, let's deal with it real quickly. Uh, Was there anybody in scripture who saw God's face? Yeah, Moses. The scripture says Moses, God knew him face to face. Did he die? No, in fact, the exact opposite. In fact, let's just let's look at this real quickly, just to just to show you. And um, but anyway, this whole series is about that. This whole series begins to unravel the wrongly held misconceptions that give birth to fear concerning the Lord that we're not supposed to have. Exodus thirty three eleven says this, and the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and then Moses begins to have this encounter with the Lord. He begins to talk to him. And he says, Lord, I want you to show, show me your glory. You know, you've said that you're going to send us and uh, don't go with us, uh, or don't send us if you don't go with us, but show us your glory. Show me your ways. Show me your glory. And the Lord says this to him. The Lord says, I will do this thing which you have spoken. Verse 17. For you found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, I beseech you, Lord, show me your glory. And listen to what the Lord says. The Lord says, I will make all of my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy. I want to see what it said about me. If there it said Ben Dixon was ministry director, I want to see what it would say about me. It just gives my name and nothing else. (laughs) Life's too short not to have fun. Look at verse 20. And he said... You cannot see my face. Now listen to this. Last sentence. For no man shall see, for there shall no man see my face and live. So when the Lord begins to show this whole thing to me, I go, okay, what do I do with this verse, Lord? This doesn't make any sense. I can see Moses, you knew Moses face to face. It says it in verse 11. Other places, Deuteronomy 34, it says that you knew him face to face. We know that he sat in your glory for for 80 days, 40 days, uh, pre-breaking the tablets, 40 days afterwards. You knew him face to face. What is this about? And now now you're saying that no one can see his face and live. And the Lord um, began to show me some things. Again, my degrees in psychology. I have a minor or related work in mathematics and philosophy. I'm a philosophically driven, very logical, systemic thinker. When I see things that don't fit, I go, something's wrong here. How do they fit? Because I promise you, this in no place contradicts itself. I'd like to say that again and get a little bit more juice on it. This does not contradict itself. Okay, this is awesome. So every place that appears that there's a contradiction, there is actually a revelation. So I asked the Lord, I said, what is this about? And he said this, where it says here, you cannot see my face and live. Or he says, for you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. I thought, you know, that doesn't say that if you see me, you die. It says no one can see me and live. So I looked up that word live uh, in the Hebrew, and I can mutilate the Hebrew just like anybody else. But what that word means is this. It it doesn't mean just live. It means to live or to preserve your life or to keep your life the way it was. So let's plug that in. No one can see my life or no one can see my face and preserve his life the way it was before. Now, isn't that the point? You see, the enemy is trying to keep us from that. And he systematizes his lies and he presents them as theological truth. Are you following this? And I'm not against theology. I'm for theology. I'm just for good theology. 
So look at, look at Deuteronomy 34. And I'll actually, because we know Moses did not die by seeing God's face. In fact, something different happened. Now, let's watch this. Deuteronomy 34, 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. You know the story. Uh, Moses had miscommunicated the heart of God in Numbers, Numbers chapter 20. He broke the tablets. He expressed that God was angry when God was not angry. God said, because you did this, you're unable to lead the people into the promised land. But he let him see it. So he goes and he shows Moses. He takes him and he shows him the promised land. But it says here that Moses died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in this place. Moses, verse 7, was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim. His vision was undiminished. And his natural strength or life force was undiminished or unabated. His body was not corrupting. He was not going the way of all flesh. He had stopped decaying. The aging process had stopped with him. He was at 120 and he was as strong as he was when he was younger. That's what the scripture says. This is the Bible. How many of you have ever read that obscure, very strange passage in Jude where it says, when Michael was contending with Satan over the body of Moses, he did not bring an accusation. How many of you read that? And you go, what in the world is that about? I mean, there's just some crazy random stuff in there, it seems like. It seems like. Conservative biblical commentators believe, conservative biblical commentators believe that Satan was contending with Michael over the body of Moses because he wanted Israel to be able to find Moses' body because Moses' body, according to Deuteronomy 34, was not decaying. And his body would not, even after death, would not decay because he had been so transformed physically by the glory of God that Satan wanted Israel to find him and to prop him up and to worship him like idols like they had been fallen into doing all along anyway. Are you following this? You've probably heard this. I mean, this is standard orthodox theology that, or commentators believe this. Check it out. Through his encounters with God face to face, Moses had been so radically altered physically that he would not have died had the Lord not taken him into the land of Moab. And according to the scripture says, he died according to the word of the Lord. The Lord had to literally prop him up, look at him and say, Moses, die! <laughs> because he was not going to die naturally. I mean, that's what it says. Are you following this? And so what, 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 what was the Lord saying? Why did he not let Moses see his face here? Because if he saw his face, he wouldn't be able to, to preserve his, if he saw his face, he wouldn't be able to preserve his life. I believe that had the Lord allowed him to see his glory in this revealed way that he had never seen it before, Moses would have been transfigured, transformed, but still with an unrenewed mind. Which would have been a terrible place to live. See, there are people who think that the Lord kicked Adam, the man and the woman, out of the garden because they sinned. And they think that was punishment. It wasn't punishment, it was protection. He had to place a cherubim there so that they couldn't come back in and eat of the, tree of the, of the fruit of the tree of life and live forever in a place of being afraid of God and separated from Him. Are you following this? He's so kind. He's so loving. He's so tender. He's so profoundly different than we believe. And we need our minds renewed. It's not that we don't need teaching, but we need teaching that renews our minds to the goodness of God. And so anyway, that's what that's about. But it's got a whole bunch of more stuff that I confront in there. That's just one little piece. I got started last night. So that deals with who God is. Because that's what the first deception was about. The second deception that came to mankind was that we were not like him. And that we need to reach out and do something. I have news for you. Jesus has brought about that restoration of us being like the Father. And that's what Christ in you, the hope of glory, is about. That's, 
that there's actually two series. I only brought a, a small contingent of volume two. And this got started out of getting a traffic ticket just outside of Death Valley on the way to Las Vegas a number of years ago. <laughs> Absolutely true story. The Lord is doing this thing with me on Christ and you. He's shown me this whole revelation. It's profound. And in the process of it happening, I get a traffic ticket. I got pulled for speeding um, just outside of Death Valley. Have you ever been to Death Valley? They've got these things out there in the desert called dips. You know, they're, they're these, they're not really dips, they're, they're like gigantic speed bumps in the road. And my kids were all young, my little girls were like five and seven or six and eight. And so I discovered that if, if I just went a little bit faster, then what would happen was it would feel like a roller coaster and, the, and they were just squealing with delight in the background. But then I had that really bad, and you know, you should never do that. That was, it was wrong, don't get me wrong, but it was wrong. But I had this, I had this, uh, that really bad sinking prophetic feeling that there was a cop coming. And I, and I had already started slowing down, but it was too late because he came over like dip number five ahead while I was still back. And so he came up and um, walked up to my wife's side of the, the car and I just threw my hands up and said, I am as guilty as sin. I am so wrong. If you want to put me under the jail, I apologize. I'm just, and he went. Wow, I've never had anybody respond like that. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> and so he marked the ticket way down and uh, told me that I could do a traffic school. And get out of it. So when I got the ticket, it was still in California near Death Valley. It came from Inyo County, I-N-Y-O. Okay? And just listen to me. This county is remarkable. It has the highest peak in the lower 48 and the lowest place in the entire United States in the same county. I, when I heard that, I thought that's, that's not physically possible. You couldn't have an almost 15,000 foot mountain and Death Valley or Badwater in the same place, but it's in the same county. That's how large it is. Okay? And so the Lord began to speak to me that some of the highest things that we could ever find were in this. And what he began to show me was this. He spoke to me very clearly. He said, Steve, the body of Christ is speeding through the greatest revelation that I've given to it. Christ in you, I-N-Y-O, the hope of glory. See, I was speeding through in you county. Are you following this? And so... It turns out that there's only one Inyo or Inyo county in the entire U.S. It is a Native American word which means the dwelling place of the Great Spirit. Oh, yeah, come on. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and see, we've got to slow down. There's a whole bunch of other stuff related to that, but... Anyway, this is a revelation of what's happened to us now in Christ and what's available to us. And I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time on that tonight. And the last is developing a sustainable supernatural life. It's about how to live and God's plan for us living and not just doing supernatural ministry at times, but living a holistic, integrated, sustainable supernatural life. Okay? You're not just supposed to do supernatural ministry. You're supposed to have a supernatural marriage. Supernatural kids. My kids have super. My daughter has a supernatural soccer career. I talked about it this afternoon. It's unbelievable. It's, it's continuing. So that's what, that's what those are about. That's a better job of doing that than I had done earlier so forgive me for not communicating a little bit better about that. Turn with me, if you will, real quickly to John chapter 14. And I appreciate every time that Ben has gotten up and shared, um, I think he's really, you know, hit the nail on the head in terms of kind of what the heart of the Lord is. And he was talking about looking at fields and then Jesus really taking their vision away from the natural and talking to them about the supernatural. And honestly, if you can hear this, what, what happened to mankind in the beginning through the fall was this. We fell from being supernatural. We fell out. 
of heaven, we fell from being supernatural to being natural. And here's what you need to understand. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make natural people supernatural. Let me say that again. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make natural people supernatural. Let me say it a little bit more dramatic. Jesus came to make those that were human divine. Now, I chose my words very carefully there. He did not come to make humans deity. There is one deity. But he came to make us divine. We are no longer, if you read the scripture, we are no longer mere men and women. We are now a mixture of the human and the divine. We're part of a race of beings that never existed prior to Jesus' resurrection. Let that bake your noodle. I mean, that's unbelievable. <laughs> this is your noodle up here, okay? That's, that's actually a line from the Matrix. You know, when the, when the oracle said, and this will really bake your noodle. You know, so anyway, sorry, that's just a, stuck in my mind. When mankind fell, he didn't fall down. He fell out. The fall wasn't a trip. It wasn't an oops, look what happened. When mankind partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we fell from the exalted place that God had placed us in heaven with him, that place of authority over the earth, that supernatural component. We fell out and we fell down. Is this making sense to you? If not, just act like it does and I'll keep talking and it'll make sense as you go. Okay, What Jesus came to do was not just to make God happy with us again. God was never displeased with us to begin with. He came to give us a new birth. He came to birth us from a heavenly place. He came to re-exalt, replace us where we had originally been placed to begin with. All right, follow with me. John 14. I'm going to show you this. And this is the shift that we need. We're in, the, we're in the process of a revolution away from the natural to the supernatural. And it's, it's much more thorough than you could ever imagine, but not nearly as spooky as it sounds. Okay? John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, don't be afraid. You believe in God, believe in me too. It's Jesus saying that. In my Father's house are many mansions. Some of your translations, the more modern one will say what? Rooms. In the Father's house are many rooms. I think that is actually a better translation because in your Father's house there couldn't be many mansions. A house has rooms. Is everybody following this? Okay. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Okay. My father's house has a lot of rooms, places for people to dwell. I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you to myself. Now listen to this. That where I am, you may also be. Remember this language. I'll remind you about it. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know how you're going to get there. We don't know the way. We don't know where you're going, we don't know the way. Now, I want to key in on four and five real quickly, and then I'm going to come back to the other. Jesus said, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know the way, and we don't know how you're going to get there. Are you ready for this? This is profound revelation. I'm serious. Jesus believes you know things that you don't think you know. Everybody follow that? 
Jesus told Thomas, you guys know. I mean, how do you know the Lord was not wrong? Okay, eight of you. That's great. But it's not a trick question. Okay. Jesus is looking at me saying, you guys know where I'm going and you know the way. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. When Jesus tells you that you know something, you know it. Okay. We are prone to not capture things that we know. Have you ever been listening to somebody and they're saying stuff and you can feel all over you, this is accurate, but you can't, you, have, you don't have context for it, you can't wrap your mind around it. You know it. But you're needing that renewal of your mind so you can capture it. Okay? Now this should give you confidence that you know things that you don't think you know. My kids already got a handle on this. I try to tell them so all the time, they go, I know. They don't listen to one thing. My kids are smartest kids, but they, know, they don't need anything I suggest. It's awesome. All right, so anyway. <laughs> now, here's what I want to suggest to you. How do I say this? Hold your spot here and go back to John 3. Hold John 14 and go to John 3. You guys probably all know this. This is by no means dramatically revelatory. But listen to this. There was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Teacher, we know that you were a teacher come from God. For no man can do the miracles that you do except God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Except a man is born again. What do some of your translations say there instead? Born what? Born twice. Somebody else would say born where? Born again. There might be margin notes that will say born from above. Anybody have that? Okay, handful of you. Except a man is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, wait, wait, wait a second, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? That won't work, he'll be too large. <laughs> I'm, not being, I'm not trying to be cute, that's literally what he was saying. It's, it's awesome, these guys were just blunt. Okay. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter. The kingdom of God. Now, people have tried to say, well, that means being baptized in the water and being baptized in the Spirit. No, it doesn't. It means being born of the water, being born from the amniotic fluid, the, the bag of water, being born naturally, and then born from above, born of the Spirit, which is born supernaturally. You can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born naturally is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you have to be born from above. And he goes on and Nicodemus basically begins to come unglued and says, I don't understand how this stuff can be. And Jesus said, are you a master of Israel? You don't know these things? Nicodemus means literally master of the people or conqueror of the people. And so Jesus is using a play on his name there saying, are you a master in Israel? You don't know these things? Truly, truly, I say unto you, we speak that that we know, we testify what we've seen, and you don't receive our witness. Now listen to this. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Are you ready for this? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Are you capturing this? Jesus is saying to him, Nicodemus, no one has ascended up to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, stand here talking to you right now, which, what was that tense of that verb? It's present. Which is, who is in heaven. Jesus was saying, Nicodemus, you were saying to me that you know I've come from God because no one can do the miracles that he does except God's with him. I'm telling you, he's not with me. 
I am with him right now in a heavenly place. He was answering Nicodemus's question, but he was saying this, it's something much greater than you've ever imagined. God's not just with me. He's not just endorsing my life. He's not just, I'm not just down here doing the right thing, and because I'm doing the right thing, the cosmic tumblers are lining up and a little bit of heaven drops down. I'm actually living, walking on the earth, while at the same time seated in a heavenly place with the Father. I've been born from above, I've, so I'm in heaven right now while I'm walking on the earth. Is this a new concept? Okay. All right. This is biblically grounded in the scriptures. I will go a little bit further with this. Let's, let's flip over to John 14. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, not where I'm going, but where I am. He was saying, I am there right now. And I'm going to prepare a place for you, and then I'm going to come and I'm going to receive you unto myself so that you too can dwell in these heavenly places. He was not in this instance talking about his second coming in order to come and to take us all to live in heaven. He was talking about the new birth and the sending of the Holy Spirit that would enable us to live an exalted life, a heavenly life while walking on the earth. Are you following this? Okay. And I can prove it to you. I mean, I'm a philosophical guy. I'm a logical guy. I'm, I'm a context guy. If I prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may also be. So let's go on down. And of course, this is where you have this awesome promise, John 14, 12. It's truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do in greater works. That's unbelievable. But I'm going to skip that because I don't have time. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, advocate, booster, promoter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him, neither know him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. Okay? I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Jesus equates here the sending of the Holy Spirit who will abide with us forever to Him coming to us. Are you following this? So in verse 18, He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the comforter. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's what He said right there. Verse 18, I will come to you. That's what He was referring to in verse 3 when He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may also be. We were created to live in a heavenly realm. We were created to live like Jesus lived. We were created, we were created naturally. And then God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And when he did it, we became a living soul. The natural man made from the earth became supernatural. It placed us in an exalted position in heaven with God, which gave us authority over the earth supernaturally. When we disobeyed God, when we believed the lies and the deception of the enemy in Adam and we ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, our connection with God was broken. And instead, we fell and we become natural beings at that point. Being born from above, being born again, being born of God, 
re-exalts us up to that heavenly place that we were originally created to dwell. Are you following this? Ephesians 2 says that we have been raised up. He quickened us when we were dead in our sins. He made us alive and has raised us up and seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, when you got born again, People spend their lives trying to figure out what to do to get to heaven. When you got born again, you got planted there. Just like Jesus, when he walked the earth, did what he did, not by being on the earth and simply doing things that were pleasing and, and God would you know, shoot little, little, boom, little, little heaven missiles down. And, and No. Jesus was moving in the heavenly realm while on the planet. Remember, the original plan of God, which never changed, was for God to supernaturally transform the planet through supernatural people. Is everybody okay with this? So what I'm saying is, you're in heaven right now. What we have to lose is the mindset that we're down here, natural people walking in natural life, trying to figure out how to get God to answer our prayers. We've got to break out of feeling separate from Him. We are, the Scriptures are clear. We are no longer separate from Him. We've been brought in. We've been made close. Uh, Eugene Peterson in the message said it this way. This way. You who are sometimes aliens are now made insiders. We are insiders in the kingdom of God. Insiders. I, I, was, I was all over this several years ago. I'm still all over this. All I think about every day is just, I'm in heaven. I'm in heaven. And so when I lay hands on the sick, I'm not laying hands on the sick strictly from earth wondering if God is paying attention at the moment. I'm seated with Him in a heavenly place in Christ. And when I lay my natural hands on them, my heavenly hands are being laid on them as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, we're supernatural people. We're not... We're not trying to live a better natural life. We're not trying to live a good natural life. We're living a completely different kind of life while on the planet. When Jesus said, I came to give them life and life more abundant, He didn't just mean a whole lot more life. He meant a different quality of life. Eternal life is not just a quantity of time that we're going to be with God. It's a quality of relational existence and a different, a completely different expression of life now. It's not born of our efforts. It's by birth. What are you saying? I'm saying you're in heaven right now. And one of the things that we're going to discover is... When we have a vision, it's not God shooting a vision across the heavenlies and it smacks us in the back of the head and we have a vision. When we have a vision, we're seeing with the eyes we don't normally see with. Are you following me? That's why when we're worshiping and when we're praying and we're waiting on the Lord... We have visions and we hear from Him much more clearly because we're slowing down. We're acknowledging, I mean, worship, face it. Let's, let's just look at this for what it really is. When we worship, we are moving in an amazing place of faith. We're singing to an invisible God and believing that He is honored by it. 
That's remarkable faith. And he invades it. Or is, is it him invading it? Or is it us beginning to experience where we're already dwelling? Ultimately, it doesn't matter. It's just encouraging. (laughs) Which is what we need. Now, what this does is this takes healing out of the realm of the natural and places it into a supernatural place. It gives us great confidence, which is what we need. But Jesus did what he did as a man living on the earth, but a man filled with the Spirit, which is what mankind was created for, which made us supernatural. Are you following this? So what are you saying? I'm saying, when you got born again, you got planted in the heavens. You got re-exalted. I'm old, but I'm okay. (laughs) The chair may not be there. So, if you feel like the enemy is just beating on you, then the bottoms of your feet must be really taking a beating. (laughs) And if you feel distant from God, your feeling is not accurate, It's a product of the deception or a product of how prominent we're viewing the natural world instead of what's really real. And so what happens is this. Right now when something bad happens in our life or it looks like God's not going to show up, most of us panic. But if you have confidence that you're already seated in the place that most of us have been spending our lives trying to get to. Just listen. If we start from the place that most of us have a goal to end up. Did you catch that? God plants us there at the beginning. How much more is he going to release to us what we need? And how much can, more can we have confidence in him to come through? So when something bad happens, instead of panicking and thinking everything's terrible, we can just go, oh, there is an amazing upgrade coming for us in this season. See, when you got born again, You didn't just get a new shot at life. It wasn't Steve Thompson version 1.1. Go get them, pal. I wiped your past away. Go take another shot at it. No. That me died and there was a brand new upgraded me. A brand new version of me that was born. Not just a natural me. A supernatural me. With new abilities. New capabilities. This is what happened to you when you got born again. And see, we all see when John is talk, or when Jesus is talking in John, we're imagining this as us going to heaven when we die. It's not. See, Jesus didn't just come so that we could get to heaven. He came so that God could get reinvolved in the earth. And he needed a supernatural people to do that with. That was always His plan. But see, what's happened is, most of us, in capturing a vision of our task, in capturing a vision of what God wants to do with us, we can get all excited about that, but we can also feel pressure. You can feel pressure because how many of you know if we're trying to transform the world naturally, we should feel some pressure? But we're not trying to transform it naturally. We're transforming it supernaturally. And we don't have to produce that supernatural quality of life. It's already been granted to us. Let me give you a couple of examples. Are there any questions about this? Great, thank you. All right, good. (laughs) Now, your, 
you're starting from the place that most people are trying to get to. You're starting from being planted in heaven. That ensures success. About two years ago, two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, I began to feel a stirring from the Lord. In 19, in the 80s, I had an encounter with the Lord. The Lord began to speak to me prophetically. I didn't even know what the prophetic was. Lifelong member of a Baptist church. I didn't do it very well. It was a great church. Um, you know, I struggled. I was a nominal believer at best. I began to, when I was in the university, I began to make some steps towards the Lord. I had a really radical encounter with the Lord, began to have dreams, began to have visions, began to move prophetically, began to have words of knowledge and all this stuff, did not know what it was, ministered for three years outside of the church before I ever ministered prophetically in a church because we didn't have any context for the prophetic. So we just did it in public, we prophesied to people, and they got born again. This was 86, 87, we led hundreds of people to the Lord. It's pretty cool stories, okay? But that's not my purpose. So that, that's, where, that's kind of where I came from, and, and then the Lord gave me this vision. He told me that if I would come aside and learn from him and stop doing this on the streets, but instead begin to train a group of people, that he would release a generation who could do what I was doing then in the 80s on the streets. And he was just saying that was my part in it. And so I played a part in helping usher back in an awareness of the prophetic ministry in the church. Okay? There are lots of different people doing it, so that's where we are. About three years ago, the Lord began to capture my attention about something, and he began to show me that there was a new assignment that I had. And I was very excited about it because he showed me what it was. He showed me that where the prophetic gift had been taken out of the mystical realm and made accessible for every believer, that he was going to do that with the supernatural life. He was going to make the supernatural life beyond what any of us imagined uh, real and palpable and tangible and attainable instead of something mystical and weird. Are you with me? And he showed me, okay, there's new things you need to do. You need to begin moving in this realm, blah, 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 blah. And I went, okay, great. And so I thought, it was, I thought I was going to do it in the ministry that myself and another gentleman had developed for 20 years or 18 years at that point. I was very excited. I thought, oh, this is great. We're going to make this shift. And then the Lord began to speak to me and said, you're not going to do it here. And I thought, oh, this is not very good. <laughs> and I've spent 20 years... My wife and I had been married six months when Rick and I began working together. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of history. And so, fall of 2009, the Lord spoke very clearly to me and said, you, you need to leave what you've developed. You need to turn over everything you've done. And I'd already been doing that as a, as a practice. And he said, I'm, I'm, I want you to step out of what you know. And he said, I want you to take a year, invest in your son, Take a break after 20 years, and I want you to begin to develop some other things. I want you to write on some, some other aspects other than just prophecy and this kind of thing. So I just go, okay. And then he speaks to my wife on my birthday. <laughs> and speak to me, he speaks to my wife on my birthday. And tell us that we're supposed to move to California. And I thought, ah, oh, this, you know, this is really not that cool. <laughs> So we ended up moving last year from the north part of the southeast to the south part of the northwest. A major, major life shift. We had to explain to our kids that we were going to uproot them out of the lives that we had developed. Um, I mean, you've you got to understand, I was a number two guy in an organization uh, that was having international influence, and we had 200 employees. I absolutely loved what I was doing, and the Lord said, you need to walk away. I, would, I mean, he'd been giving me this Abraham thing for about three years, and I went, yeah, this is an awesome thing. I can't wait to teach on this. I, I knew, I mean, I was lying to myself because I knew he was asking me to leave what I knew and what was established to go into something I couldn't see yet. Now, ultimately, I'm trying to share with you a story that will just encourage your socks off. So... We're in the process of doing all this. We don't tell people we're going to move because even though we've left, we were concerned if we left the area quickly, it would destabilize the organization. We didn't want to do that because we invested in it for 20 years. And so we haven't told anybody we're going to do this. So my daughter, Madison, who some of you know her story, she turned 13 last year. So she wanted to go to England. So we went to England and 
a guy who's an executive with Man U, Manchester United, heard the stories of her soccer thing, contacted me and said, if you're ever in the UK, I'd like to host you guys at a Man U game at Old Trafford. And so um, I was doing a conference in London, so I took my wife and my, my 13-year-old daughter, and we celebrated her birthday there in London, and we went up and they hosted us at a Man U game. It was a very, very cool story. And so... The last night of the conference, while my wife and my daughter are doing all the sightseeing stuff, I'm doing a conference. It's the way it works for dads. We work while everybody else plays, and so we love it. It's wonderful. My, my wife and daughter come to the last meeting at the conference that I'm doing, and so woman, this woman runs up. We're having a big ministry time. This woman runs up to my wife, and she says, the Lord has given me five components of a word for you. Would it be okay if I share them with you? And no one knew we were moving. And no one, so we, our kids were the only ones who known, and they'd known a week. This was in April of last year. We hadn't told anybody where we're going, but the Lord had spoken to us. We, I guess we had actually told Bill and Benny Johnson, but n- no one else knew at that point. So here, here's what happens. This woman comes up to my wife and she says this. She says, Don't worry about your housing. God has every detail of your housing covered. And then she said, I saw a vision of a house... And it was like the kind of house that you would see in the Pacific Northwest, in Washington, Oregon, or Northern California. And then she goes on with two other words, and then she says, and the last thing I saw was a blue door. And those were the five five parts of the word. That was on a Saturday. We flew home on the next day, Sunday. I flew on Monday out to Reading to meet with some people. On Thursday of that week, a woman comes up to my wife at one of my daughter's soccer games and says, do you know of a five-bedroom large house in your neighborhood that is available for rent? I need to rent one for two years, and I'm willing to pay this amount of money. <laughs> now, we, when the Lord said, don't worry about your housing, we've got every, I've got every detail covered, I told my wife, I said, that means our house here." and the house that we need in California. Five days later, unannounced, no one knowing anything, a woman comes up to my wife and asks that she ended up leasing our house for two years a month and a half later when we moved. Okay, how many would say that's supernatural? That's not even the beginning of the story. I thought it would be simple to find a house in the Redding area, Northern California. I wasn't thinking about the fact I was moving from Charlotte, a metro area of two million people, to a non-metro area in Northern California of 100,000 people. So if you just do the math, there's about 5% of the number of houses in Reading that there is in Charlotte area. Not only that, I found out that they don't have houses for people with five children. (laughs) Except houses that are like two or three million dollars, which, you know, you can count the money in my pocket. It's, my pockets are not that deep. And so we had asked my kids, I said, what do you want to do? And I, I felt like the Lord said, Your kids need to have an investment in this, and they need to have a voice in the move. And I went, okay. So I said to them, what's important to you? They said, we we like a lot of land. We don't like living on the golf course now. It looks like we have a lot of land, but we don't. We liked it when we lived in the mountains more. We had 10 acres to play on and all that. We like land. I said, okay, what else? They said, a pool. I said, okay. I flew out to Reading four times to look at every, I looked at every house imaginable. I could not find anything that would work for my family, for my family to buy or to lease. I couldn't. Find, I mean, I looked at everything. I had two real estate agents. They, I would communicate with them. I look, I couldn't find a thing. The clock is ticking. Did I mention that we had already leased our home? <laughs> our home was to be leased effective July first. We had a short season. We had a very short window to move. On July 11th, I had to leave to go to Australia for three weeks. And so we were going to leave near the end of June to get settled in Reading by July 1st because I had to leave July 11th. But the Lord said, don't worry about your housing. (laughs) So he comes through and he provides on the first end. I flew out here four times, couldn't find anything. During one of my trips out here, somebody contacted me, to Reading, somebody contacted me and said, listen, a friend of mine has bought a house as an investment It's a five-bedroom house. It's furnished. He knows you. He just heard you're moving out here, and he would like to make it available to you for nine days so you don't have to stay in a hotel when you're moving your stuff into your house. 
And I said, that's incredibly kind. We'll, just, we'll pray about it, but we'll probably do it. So I, I felt good about it, so we told the guy, and it was, just, it was great. So it gave us a place to land for nine days. Meanwhile, I can't find a place. <laughs> you got to understand, I'm a long-range planner. We have vacations planned out with five children a year and a half in advance. Because you have to. It's the only way to make flights work and all that. I mean, I can tell you where I'm going to be almost every day for the remainder of this year. I'm a planner. I may look a little haphazard, but I'm a planner. Okay? So we get to the end of June, and I have still not found a house. I said to my wife, I... I, this is really disturbing. I said, but I have zero concern in my heart. She said, you know, Steve, honestly, I don't have any either. She's certainly not like that. Okay? So we actually got, we loaded up our stuff. We loaded up a huge truck full of stuff because I could not hire a moving van. I didn't have an address to give them. <laughs> I told people for years, don't you ever do anything like this. You understand? I mean, I was a pastor, planted five churches. Don't ever do anything like this. The Lord tells us, you have to do this. He, he literally told me, he said, you're just going to have to go. I acted like I didn't hear him. You know, I was like, Lord, I just cry out to you again. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just blocking that thing. I'm not listening to that. We couldn't find anything. I wasn't, I mean, I kept looking. I wasn't concerned. I finally said to my wife, I said, we're just going to need to put this on hold. I'll need to catch a flight from here instead of Sam. She said, we need to go. And I thought, this is definitely God. So the day before we left, I just thought, I've got to check. And there's one thing I haven't checked. I haven't looked on Craigslist. Like I'm going to find a five-bedroom house on, or six-bedroom house on Craigslist, you know, so... Interestingly enough, I get on Craigslist, and there it, it has a 25-acre property, the 5,500-square-foot house and guest house, with a pool, a lighted tennis court, it's gated with security system, and a three-acre lake. Oh <laughs> on Craigslist. <laughs> and I thought... This, this just can't be. This has got to be a scam because I'd seen other scams. You, you know what I'm talking about. And when it showed what they, and it wasn't for sale, but it was for lease. And when I saw the lease price on it, I thought, that has got to be a scam. That's ridiculous. That's about a third of what a house like that would, would re, re, rent for. So I, I called and couldn't get an answer. I thought, oh, it's definitely a scam. So we packed up a truck and we moved our family 2,500, 2,900 miles the way I had to drive because of the, um, the route we had to take with all the stuff with only nine days to stay in a place while we obtained another house. And it wasn't like I had extra time because I was flying to Australia on July 11th. So my son and I arrived with the stuff. My wife and the four other kids took a different uh, path across the states. We got there a day before they did. By that time, I had located the name of the property management group that was this house. And so anyway, I, I go and look at it. It is unbelievable. 25 acres, gated, t lighted tennis court, pool, outside areas, decks, and porches that you can entertain 250 people on this piece of property. I found, I found the old place where they were, had it for sale, and they didn't sell it. They were asking $2.2 million for it. So I began to talk to the property management group, the Three Acre Lake. This is a beautiful piece of property. So I began to, my wife got in the next day. I said, hey, I got a place you want, I want you to look at. So she came and she said, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so we negotiated. We negotiated back and forth. It was, it was honestly, we got this thing for just a fraction above what our mortgage was back east. Now, for that property, we pay about what, or maybe a little bit less, or about what the property taxes are annually. But that's what we pay in, in rent. And it has a blue door. 
Uh, people have come, now people have come from Reading, people of Danny Silk and his wife were over, and others have come over, and they go, we didn't know anything existed like this in Reading. I've bumped into people now. I bought a car from a woman who's a banker, and she said, now, where do you live? And I told her, she said, I know that property. She said, that belonged to that neurosurgeon. I went, yeah. She said, hey, he did surgery on my, my husband and on my wife. I know this guy. He's the toughest businessman in the area. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> it's an unbelievable story. I can't even go into the other parts of it. But here, are... there are places that the Lord has for us to dwell that have been prepared for us well before we ever thought of this. Uh, there's something that you can't imagine. There's an abundance. There's a type of life. And I'm not talking about material prosperity. I'm talking about a supernatural quality of life. In some cases, it may have to do with material abundance. But that's not the big deal. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Listen, that's, that's a type of prosperity, but that's not the type of prosperity. And for us, this is just about a message about other things. And so, at the same time, when I, le I, I left a successful organization that I had developed with another guy for 20 years, I had a great place, I walked away from that. So I walked away from a lot of money. I walked away from a salary. I didn't join another organization. I did the exact opposite. I turned down offers to go and do things at other organizations and just did what I felt like the Lord said to do. And in the process of doing that, the school that I was telling about last night, I, I'm the 50% owner of that school. I now make 150% of what I made at Morningstar and I work one hour a week. How many of you know that's supernatural? Yeah. And that school is having dramatic impact in that community, literally. Well, some, some days it's, or some weeks it's two hours. <laughs> now, what it's doing, it is enabling me to not have to run and do a bunch of things so that I can dig into the scriptures and I can strip back the traditions and the other things so I can see what's there and I have time to do what I need to do. Are you listening to me? There's something new that's available for I'm just sort of Joe everybody. I'm not one of the, I mean, I grew up in the inner city. Uh, neither one of my parents graduated from high school. My parents were 15 and 17 when they got married. They've been married for 54 years this October. And so, I mean, but we're very insignificant as a family. I'm sort of like Joe, everybody. This is not just about me. This is about what's available for us in terms of God opening up a supernatural life. I'm seeing people healed. I'm seeing people delivered. I'm seeing businesses transformed. We're seeing, and it does not take the effort that it took in the past. I'm not saying that this is not about working and preparing and studying. Do not believe that I'm saying, don't study for tests, God will give you the answers. <laughs> I'm not saying don't work hard. That's not the case at all. It's that I don't have to work hard now to make a living so that I can work and spend my time on these other things that he's given me. Is everybody, is everybody following this? In our school, I need to tell you this. When they asked me to buy the school, I turned it down. I said, no, I don't want to do this. I'm, I had consulted with them for eight years and helped them become successful. They were losing a lot of money. They asked me to help them. I have a business understanding and a prophetic gift. And so I, I helped them, and they became very profitable. So when I moved into California, they said, we want to start paying you. I said, no, I don't want to take any money. I've been your friend all along. I never took a dime. I'm not going to do it now. Plus, I don't have time. So I And then... They wanted to pay me. So then one of the guys, the junior partner, contacted me and said, why don't you buy half of the school? I'll buy the other portion that makes up half and we'll do it together. I'll run it and you won't have to do that much. And I said, I can't do this. Four days later, I had a dream and the Lord said, you're supposed to do this. 
<laughs> and so this is not about getting it all right. This is about the kindness of God to fix our thickness. Thank you.